And we're live. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is AK. I'm coming to you from UMass Boston. And uh, we are virtually connecting today from uh, OLC Accelerate. Um, what we're accelerating is a good discussion that we're having. It's an undercurrent. Um, we are going to go uh, to um, uh, the locals uh, in the room for a quick round of introductions. And then we're going to have uh, virtual introductions. Take it away. Hi, I'm Patrice Presco. I'm an instructional designer at Cornell University and the on-site virtual buddy. And we're thrilled to have um, Stephen with us here today. He's one of the keynote presenters at the OLC conference. And I'll let him introduce himself and give a quick overview of what he's here to talk about. Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, it'd be good if we went through everybody else so I had some idea who, who we're talking to so I can calibrate. Okay. All right, then AK, why don't you have the virtual people um, do their intro first? For now. Right. So quick order, um, as I see you, uh, Brittany, Helen, LaDonna, and Nadine. Hi, everybody. I'm Brittany Brown O'Donnell. I'm an instructional design doc student at Virginia Tech. Hi, I'm Helen DeWard. I'm an instructor with Faculty of Education in Central Ontario. I'm happy to meet you. Hey guys, um, I'm LaDonna Minnis, and I'm actually working as Director of Education for a nonprofit called We Are The Next, and I studied um, instructional design for grad school and been kind of watching on the perimeter, but this is actually my first session to participate, so I'm excited to learn with you guys. Nadine, can you hear us? He's on mute. Yep, I can you. Hi everyone, I'm Nadina Bulmagd. I work at the American University in Cairo at the Center for Learning and Teaching. And I'm very excited to be here. Um, very nice to meet you. And uh, that's it. And back to you. Okay, so I'm Stephen Koslin. Um, I'm a cognitive science, cognitive neuroscience person by training. I'm interested in the science of learning. And I spent about three decades on the Harvard faculty. I was a chair of the department there and then dean of social sciences. And then I left there to go to Stanford, where I was uh, director of the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences. I uh, met a guy named Ben Nelson, who had just gotten $25 million to start a new university from scratch. Uh, and he convinced me to design the curriculum for them. We have since raised another 70 some odd million dollars and still need to raise a lot more. But we now are on our third class. I just last night at 2 a.m. got back from Berlin, uh, a group of 150 of them in a residence hall. Uh, they spend the first year in San Francisco, and then they go to Berlin, then Buenos Aires, uh, then Seoul, then Hyderabad, uh, then Taipei, then London, and they come back to San Francisco to graduate. So uh, what do you see at OLC? What are some of the interesting um, undercurrents that you are picking up, at least for uh, the last couple of sessions? And um, what do you see? What's interesting? Why don't I first tell you a little more about what we're doing before you ask questions, if that's OK? So if you can give me like four minutes to give you a quick overview of what Minerva is about, it really is different. Mm -hmm. There's really nothing like it. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I can summarize the differences very quickly and just ask questions if you want to know more details so i'll give you a very very high level what we teach and why we teach it is different so we focus on what we call practical knowledge and by practical knowledge we don't mean pre-professional we don't mean vocational we mean knowledge that is generative and can help you adapt to a changing world so we want our students to succeed at jobs that don't even exist yet so what it comes down to is a focus on critical thinking, creative thinking, effective communication, and effective interaction with other people. So that's number one. What we, what we teach and why we teach it is different. Number two, how we teach is different. Everything we do is based on the science of learning. So there's an enormous amount that's now known about perception, memory, knowledge acquisition, uh, comprehension, problem solving and so forth. There's a huge, huge literature. As far as I know, Minerva is the only place 
that draws on the, those literatures for everything we do, which has resulted in our only offering seminars that are limited to 19 students with a full-time faculty member present, uh, all active learning. There's no lectures at all at Minerva. It's, it's a flipped classroom design. So what we teach is different practical knowledge. How we do it is different. It's based on the science of learning. The third thing is how we deliver it. It's all over computer. We have a proprietary platform that is designed just for seminars, uh, active learning seminars. It has a lot of tools built into it that allow us to teach very effectively and more importantly, allow the students to learn more effectively. And that's by taking advantage of the science of learning, sort of designed with that in mind from the beginning. And the fourth piece is we adopt an international perspective. We think the future is increasingly international. 80% uh, of our students are not American and they live in seven different countries over the course of their four years. And the reason for that is there's no better way to get them comfortable and familiar with people from different cultures than by having them live together and interact together. Okay, that's a quick overview that should orient you what we're doing. It's very, very different than what anybody else is doing. Okay, so if, if people want to ask uh, questions, and I just wanted to note that Stephen just got in at 2 a.m., so I don't think he's really had a chance yet to get an idea of the themes that are emerging I here. I have no idea. I don't know what see. I just woke up and came down yeah. here. I have yeah. no clue what's going on. <laughs> so you can tell me. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, oh, 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 feedback, feedback. Uh, okay, I'm going to mute my... Uh, my own speakers while I talk, just in case it's me. Um, one of the questions that I had, I, I think it's fascinating, uh, uh, the Minerva project, uh, and I do think this uh, international aspect um, is really uh, important. Uh, one of the things that first came to mind is accreditation. Everybody in the U.S. is thinking, oh, is this uh, program accredited? And I work for an online program, and that's one of the first questions that comes up. What kind of um, questions or hurdles uh, did you have to deal with in starting a program that is international first and not thinking with the national borders? Well, it is carefully accredited. We're accredited by WASC, which is the Western Association of Schools and Colleges. It's what accredits the UC system, Stanford, USC, and so forth. Um, we've done that by partnering with the Keck Graduate Institute, which is the most recent of the Claremont Colleges. So our students, uh, until we graduate a class, will graduate with Claremont degrees, with Keck degrees. degrees. Uh, it was actually very easy. I, I was uh, spearheading uh, the seven uh, proposals we wrote, all of which are approved. Five colleges. We have a college in arts and humanities, computational sciences, business, uh, uh, social sciences, natural sciences. And each one of those has six programs within it. Uh, it was actually fairly painless, and there really hasn't been a problem with our international orientation. Uh, they start a year in San Francisco, and they come back at the very end and graduate. And the fact that we're using the cities as campuses, this is our conception, and taking advantage of what the different cities have to offer, integrating that in the curriculum was, was a big selling point. They just visited us, by the way, just like last week for a progress report. And we're, I'll tell you this, at the end of one of the sessions, it's, uh, one of the examiners turns to us and says, I have only one word for what you're doing. Bravo. That's the last time I've, first time I've ever heard an accreditor say something like that. But we were extremely encouraged. One of our classes has learning objectives. Everyone is evaluated by rubrics. I mean, we use metrics uh, up the wazoo to evaluate what we're doing. Uh, we're very focused on learning outcomes. We, we are student-centered. You know, if you look at what WASP says they want, we're doing exactly what they say they want. I'm curious, you heard a little bit of the end of the last session where we were right. talking a lot about, you know, um, allowing for failure, letting students know it's okay to fail, yeah. you know, the oops moment. And I was just wondering how you're incorporating that into your curriculum. Yeah, so that so we're a Silicon Valley company. So Minerva is actually three organizations, one of which is a company, which are nonprofits. So the schools, which I had, are nonprofit. But the intellectual property and so forth is being developed yeah. by a company. And that's venture funded. 
So it's we're, we're a Silicon Valley company. And one of, the, one of the things that's striking is there's this mythos that failure is good. But if you fail more than a couple of times, you don't see a line of VCs mm. in front of your door knocking right. away, asking to give you money to fail again. A little success once in a while is a good idea. Uh, failure is great if it was intelligent. So if you had good reasons for trying what you did, you were thoughtful about it, and you learned something from the failure, then mm -hmm. it's just fine. In fact, it's applauded because we want risk takers. We want people who are, are not afraid to, mm -hmm. afraid to try something different, but we want it to be intelligent. We want you to be monitoring what you're doing, to be in a position before you even start. So if you do fail, you'll be able to learn something by it. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask a question around the faculty that you work with? What type of um, resources or supports do they travel with the students? Uh, do they stay stationary? How are they supported in what you perceive or, or see as the bigger picture, the, the vision of, of learning? Right. So we now have a little over 40 faculty. Um, faculty can live anywhere in the world where there's broadband because all of our courses are taught on the computer in real time. Ours are all active learning. Uh, but a big draw we have is that you can live anywhere you want. Uh, we bring the faculty together for uh, two weeks a year at the beginning of the semester, at the beginning of the first semester and at the end. Um, but in addition, there is a faculty advisory council. There are faculty full faculty meetings. Um, every Friday, all the faculty who are teaching sections of the same class meet. It happened last week and what's going to be happening going forward and what needs to be tuned, if anything. Uh, the faculty are actually quite well paid. And if, if they're uh, three quarters time or more, uh, they get full benefits as well. They get four months off over the summer. Uh, we also set up uh, faculty um, special interest groups so they can work together. I mentioned that Minerva is three things, three organizations. Uh, the two nonprofits are the Minerva Schools and then the Minerva Institute, which uh, Senator Bob Carey heads, uh, former senator. And that is about faculty research, uh, philanthropy for student tuitions and a prize we give in, for higher education every five years. So we've sort of flipped the usual model of an R1 in that we care a lot more about teaching than research but we do support research. So we do front office and back office and various other kinds of things to help, help the faculty. In fact, I just sponsored two of them for the most bizarre grant I've ever heard in my life. I was approached by a foundation and they told me they would guarantee, guarantee funding $200,000 grant for one of two faculty that I would nominate and the other they might if they liked it well enough. So one of the two is gonna get some money. So, um, yeah, we actively support research that involves anything digital, so digital humanities, mm -hmm. survey-based research, any of that. We have a fantastic tech infrastructure at Minerva, really, truly incredible, and um, research on pedagogy. So next year, our N will be big enough that we can start doing A-B testing, mm -hmm. where we can systematically vary what's in the seminars and Thank you. Sure. Um, can I just jump in here for a little bit? Um, I'm essentially an aspiring educator, right? So I'm preparing myself to when I'm going to start teaching. And because I know that the direction you guys have moved towards, which is uh, international and global learning in practical terms, that it's very important to get students immersed in these different cultures and experience diversity like that, how can you, or what are some practical ways that educators at, dare I say, traditional types of universities, but like institutions that we're part of that don't incorporate teaching, uh, sorry, traveling to that extent, what are some ways that we can, some of these benefits of international exposure? I mean, you brought up the digital, so, do you have any ideas of practical things we can actually do to experience to, to get them to experience that practical knowledge without traveling? 
Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so I think the main source of the international perspective comes from the other students. So as I mentioned, uh, it's actually about 23% of our students are American and the rest are from uh, some 50 some odd different countries and they all live together. So this is unusual. It's not a standard online kind of environment. They all live together and they often take their courses together even though their computers are open. And We need the camera on them because we're recording what's going on. But they can sit around a table and they, and they often do. So I think the main thing is just to have them bonding together. Now, if you can't get them physically in one place, uh, at least using the kind of platform we've developed, you can have students based anywhere in the world and they can be interacting and they become quite good friends, it turns out, um, even though they're not necessarily in the same place. This is now happening. Uh, we have a, a group of about 168 in San Francisco right now and about 150 in Berlin. And we're, we're going to admit probably about 250 for the next class. We'll keep growing about 50% a year, roughly like that. And the idea is that we're gonna have the students who are living in different places in the same classes and the curriculum is designed to take advantage of that. So they go out into the city on some assignment and collect some data and bring it back and do comparison and contrast depending on where they were. So for example, go to a meeting of, of a local government and try to determine what the principles are that dictate the order in which people are called on to speak. How does that work? And then we'll talk about that in the, in the class on, on uh, local government, which we offer. But I think, I think there just is no substitute for personal interaction. And, and for me, personal includes virtual, by the way. Mm. I mean, we're doing a personal interaction right now. Um, I, don't, I don't see other way to do it. Yeah, and I, I do some work in that area, Nadine. So maybe at, on, a, on a different call, we can chat well, about can that. You add, can you oh, add sure, something? sure. Please. Um, so we, what we try to do is have classrooms and say, you know, the U.S. collaborate with a classroom abroad and actually work on projects together and honestly, and have synchronous, synchronous sessions like this. Um, and, you know, to follow on what you're both saying, uh, you know, there's a huge push to have more and more students go on a study abroad for all the reasons that we've been talking about. But logistically, only a very, very small percent of students can actually physically do that traveling. Um, and so through tools like this, you know, every student can have an international experience. Yeah, yeah. I'm not a big fan of study abroad. I think it's about 10%, mm -hmm. at least the our yeah. universities go. And what they end up doing is, is um, A, they take classes with professors from their home, home institution. Mm -hmm. Okay, so why not stay home? B, they hang out with other students from the university in their dorm, mm -hmm. stay home, and C, they're tourists. They go out and mm -hmm. do touristy stuff. Yeah. What's the point? I mean, you really I want. I mean, there is a. You want them, Sorry, go ahead. No, no, I want them immersed in the in the local culture. I want them yeah. interacting with local people. Um, he says. Yeah. Yeah. And the, reason, the reason I ask is because in our culture or in Egypt, it's not very common that a lot of students travel abroad. And um, I mean, study abroad is a that our institution, it's something that I did as well, but not a lot of students do it. It's a very, very, very small percentage and only when it's an exchange program. And there's there's a lot of considerations that go into it. So it's not very easy to get students to actually travel abroad, even for a short time. Yeah. It's are too great and too important to just say, oh, because they can't travel, let's just not do that, right? So that idea or those ideas of virtual conferencing and getting them to collaborate on projects online and synchronous is actually very important, I think. Yeah. And you can have them that idea of personal conversation. Yeah. We have two Egyptian students now, by the way. And I think one of the deals that are being negotiated is uh, there's a some very wealthy person in Egypt who is considering setting up a fund to allow Egyptians to come to Minerva. So send me an email, I'll let you know what works. I will, that's great news. I'm very happy to hear it. I hope it works out, yeah. I actually have a question about specifically the platform that you talked about that's kind of proprietary um, yeah. that you guys use for seminars. Is there any way that we can see an example of what that looks like yeah. in action or experience yeah. that in some way? I'm giving a demo tomorrow morning at eight o'clock, unfortunately. Eight, but that's eight the main. Eastern time? Yeah, yeah. Uh, wherever I am, yeah. 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 All right. uh, <laughs> 
And yeah. I, I think the keynotes are going to be streamed live. Are they? Oh yeah, I think, I think they are. Yeah. So you check it out. So yeah. will they be recorded? I'm not. Uh, we can check on that. And let you know. God, okay. Just, I'll go though. Yeah. Yeah. So. Otherwise, I can yeah. try and get up at five a.m. and watch. <laughs> yeah, I know the the um, there are little snips and bits and bits of it on our website. Also, okay. look up what, What's just the Minerva? Yeah, that's the URL. Was, I think nervous schools as well get you there. Okay. And then I have one more question since I've got um, messaging a little bit of a comment. I really like the idea of the the city as a campus and that like concept. So the organization that I work with works to do um, kind of like neighborhood awareness and being proud of where you come from and learning about the history of the place that you live in, kind of inspired by. Um, you know, public spaces and historic landmarks and things like that. Um, and, I, and I heard a little bit of what I'm going to ask about coming out when you talked about going to your local government and finding out kind of like what order people are invited to speak. But I'm wondering if you can share any other specific activities that are related to kind of using the city as a campus. Yeah, there have been a lot. I mean, there, we have a whole division that that's what they do. So what they'll do is they'll identify uh, resources, like a museum, for example. Uh, or in Berlin, there is a former wall, for example. Uh, Berlin is actually packed full of uh, interesting mm -hmm. institutional things, present and previous. And the trick is to hook it to the curriculum. So it depends on what the class is, but they'll send them out with their very specific goal. So it's not just go be a tourist, check it out, come back and report. It's uh, rather, uh, uh, how do you think um, the uh, interlude of, the, of, the, of World War II affected the nature of the collection, uh, collections in this particular museum? Go take a look at that, analyze it, come back. Uh, or how do you think, there's a lot about the war in Berlin, it turns out, um, for obvious reasons. Or how do you, or the, the fall of the Berlin Wall is another thing they take advantage of. So they identify some event uh, that can be hooked in with resources, institutions that are there, and then the classes use that, that as a lever of some sort or another. Because the whole idea of practical knowledge, the focus of Minerva, is to try to hook up what they learn in class with what they can do. And that's, that's the right word, by the way, mm. do. Comes in uh, out in the real world. So that's the challenge is to try to figure ways of having it go both directions, where it goes from the class that they, they learn, they go out to some institution and so forth, or they're asked the other direction. They're asked a question about some event or institution that they're supposed to go and check out, uh, often which involve trying to interact with local people, by the way, which is okay in the cities we've chosen because English is so common. I mean, I'm just amazed how many Germans speak English, many more than speak French. I was absolutely amazed by that. Um, and then bring that back to class. And so they use that to kind of influence like some sort, I'm just wondering how they kind of um, reflect like their experience then. So what does that mean like practically? Do they like make presentations about it? Do they write they papers write about it? They write a paper. Well, sometimes it's part of, so it's all active learning. So there's no, so at Minerva we have something we call fully active learning. So we, we were faced with this problem. All our classes are taught on the computer and you can take them together, but students take them from all over the place. So there's no one looking over the shoulder. They could be doing Twitter, they could be doing, you know, whatever, Facebook. So we had to figure out some way to keep them engaged. So we've invented this set of pedagogical techniques we call fully active learning, where the goal, goal is to have 100% of the students engaged at least 75% of the time. Now the way we've done that is we think of background activities. So there's a foreground activity, like two students might be discussing something, but in the background, everybody else is trying to do a comparison contrast, what they're saying, and then there's a poll where they have to respond, and then they'll get called on to some of them, to defend on, defend what they wrote. So there's a whole bunch of these things we've come up with, 
as a way to motivate them. So what we don't do though are straight presentations. There's no lectures at all. Um, if it can be presented, they write it up ahead of time and it's read before class, flip classroom. So, and they're graded. We grade them probably on the order of 40 or 50 times a semester. There's no tests, there's no midterm, no final. There are a bunch of small papers. Uh, every class starts with a quiz and ends with a quiz, which are focused on the learning objective. And they're not multiple choice, they have to write something. And we use rubrics to grade virtually everything. And we're, we're just about 30 minutes, so I didn't know if you want to wrap up or do you want to talk a little bit more? I'm happy to keep answering questions okay. as long as people okay. have. Um, one of the questions that came up is, are you doing anything to measure student engagement? Or, you know, what, are you, is there any tool you're using for assessment of what's, you know, learning that's actually taking place? Of course. So there are four things we use. Something called the CLA Plus which is the Collegiate Learning Assessment. It's um, a, a test that, you heard of the book, Academically Adrift? You heard of that one? No? Uh, its subtitle is Minimal Learning on College Campuses. Hmm. And what they did is they took this test, which measures critical thinking, problem solving, and writing primarily, developed by a nonprofit. It's used by over 800 American universities. Hmm. Um, they used it to compare learning over time. You can also use it to compare across universities. It didn't find much. So we used that. We gave it to the students before they started and then at the end. Um, and I'm pleased to announce that they topped out. So we did very well on that. Um, we have rubrics that have been validated for every single one of our learning objectives. Scores and those do get better over time. Uh, we use surveys. We simply ask mm -hmm. the students. So before every unit, we ask the student to rate how familiar they are with the material, and then we ask them afterwards. We also give them some objective tests, questions, just a few, which they're not graded on, but we want to know if they've actually learned something from the unit. And finally, because we're focused on practical knowledge, we arrange for internships every summer, a four-month summer, and we get feedback from the employers. Uh, we want to know how well they did. We want to know what they should have known that they didn't mm -hmm. know, uh, and so mm -hmm. forth. It's a structured interview that we use. And um, the most recent one was actually every single one of the employers, this is about 23, I think, that, uh, that responded, which is over half of them, um, reported that they expected better than they expected from other mm -hmm. undergraduates. So tomorrow, I think I'll mention uh, 97%. This is a, the newest data just came in. I, I find it incredible, actually. <laughs> um, but so far, it seems to be working. But, but I have to have a huge caveat here. We had over 16,000 applications last year. We took 306. So 55% of them roughly came. But the point is we're insanely selective. Mm -hmm. So a, the, a big question for me is all these techniques and stuff we've been developing, how well they're gonna work, we're not as selective. <laughs> so we'll see, because we're not gonna do this forever. We wanna brought it up. One question that uh, came to mind as I was hearing you uh, describe uh, how Minerva works, um, is the aspect of uh, multilingualism of, or plurilingualism. So one of the things that's been happening at colleges and universities over the years, it seems that the language requirements have uh, become less uh, stringent. Uh, some of them are gotten rid of altogether. Um, with this um, international move, uh, what do you see the role of uh, multilingualism and multiculturalism uh, either as part of the curriculum or as part of the learning process? And do learners come out being uh, fluent in another language? So we are not at all focused on information transmission. So we know that about 90% of what you learn in a lecture is going to be gone within about three months. That's, that's the most optimistic. Uh, it depends on what the subject matter is and so forth. So we're focused on, on learning to use information. They get 
it's a flipped classroom from before class. Um, that information is all cast within the context of what we call big questions. So we had to figure out what content were used to introduce the our actual learning objectives, which are we call habits of mind and foundational concepts. So one of the guys who works for us uh, wrote a computer program where he went into course catalogs from all over the world and he pulled out every single question, that is every string between a period and a question mark and created this giant word cloud. And then we picked frequent questions and had three characteristics. Uh, they were used um, in at least three different countries because we're not interested in just provincial American kinds of things. They are extremely hard to answer. Uh, and finally, the process of trying to ask, answer them, to grapple with them, was lightning. It would lead to something interesting in terms of how the world was going to be. So we have a, a couple dozen of those questions which are used to organize the, the first year curriculum in particular. No, which is our general education program. It, the uh, content is extremely international. The students are very international. We're very careful not to view things purely through an American lens. Um, this was interesting, by the way, with respect to this last election we just had, in that the faculty mm. all had one perspective. But the students did not. Mm. And it turns out students from some other countries actually had a very different view. So it was a really good thing that we were careful about this because it led to some very interesting discussions. But yeah, one of our major goals is to give them an international perspective about that. It's not just something in the background that we hope will spin off automatically. So that's, that's one of the reasons we move them around the world every four months. Uh, so we don't teach foreign languages. We set it up so they can learn them. We, we actually have this fair at the end of the year. And one of them, they had a contest. This was the last year where they were in San Francisco to see who could learn the most German because they were going to Berlin. So they, they used Duolingo. They used, there were several different platforms that are on the web that they used and competed against each other to see who could learn the most. It was really quite a kick. They're, they're fantastic students very intrinsically motivated. As I say, it'll be interesting to see how this scales up and we broaden the criteria a bit. So if you're very practically oriented and this critical thinking skills and stuff, can you give us um, maybe some examples of your learning objectives sure. instead of being content driven? Yeah. Um, so the first year, course all students take four courses four year long courses there's one that centers on critical thinking one on creative thinking one on effective interaction like leadership negotiation and so on team member and then one on effective communication so reading writing giving visual presentations all that sort of thing the first under those four big core competencies their learning objectives are of two sorts. We call them habits of mind and, excuse me, foundational concepts. So I'll give you an example of each. Uh, a habit of mind would be when you're speaking to a group, adjust what you say depending on who you're talking to. So that's why I wanted to know what your backgrounds were. So what do I mean by adjust what you say? Well, depending on what your backgrounds are, I'm going to have a different level, depending on what your interests are, I'm going to select different kinds of things. Uh, depending on how much time I have, I'm going to select things differently. Depending on my own goals, I'm going to prioritize. So they learn that that's a habit of mind. The habit part is the condition that triggers it. It's very easy talking to some other to a group of people that can become habitual. The system one is Kahneman's term for it. You have to think about it. The hard part is calibrating appropriately. On the other hand, you have things like statistics, so the kind of critical thinking involves statistical thinking, where the, the back end, what you do is very straightforward. It's a formula, you plug it in. The hard part is knowing when to apply it. So by analyzing these into habits of mind and foundational concepts, it helps us focus where we need to teach, where the hard part is. 
So I, I can give you a lot of examples if you want, but those, those are two. By the way, about the language part, I should mention, uh, we do a lot of extracurricular stuff and co-curricular, another reason we haven't lived together. So I run the French table. So I take out uh, anybody who speaks French or is interested in learning French. Every two weeks, I take them out to lunch. It's about two dozen of them. And we all make a lot of French errors at each other. Um, there's a German one, there's a Spanish one. Uh, there's a lot of music, a lot of these kids are musical, stuff like that. So we're trying to do a full college experience. We're trying to pull together what we can use the computer for effectively and put that together with best practices for other aspects of life. And there were two questions in the chat. Nate had asked, do Minerva students in different cohorts interact with the same internship, same employers? And then there was a question about whether, are all the sessions synchronous? And all the sessions are synchronous, but there are different time zones. So there are seven different time zones that we use currently. Out, uh, so faculty have to be hired in part by willingness to time, teach at bizarre hours. Um, there's a, a group of core academics who are based in San Francisco. That's where headquarters are. Uh, most of the teaching staff are all over the world, South Africa, Budapest, uh, Canada, and various places. Uh, out there all over. Uh, it doesn't matter to us. We're perfectly happy. And we pay them the American dollars, so that can go very far in some places. Um, we make a point of not having this, the students stick together as a group in the same in different classes. We mix and match them. There's a computer algorithm that does that. The faculty travel uh, voluntarily, so they have to agree for, to stay at least a month overseas. So in Berlin, there, there are two apartments that are kept for faculty. I just stayed in one. Um, I was only there for 36 hours, but, but faculty are there expected to be there longer. There were a couple that were there presently uh, as a way to, to interact with them physically. We want the faculty to meet them in the flesh. That seems to be important, at least for us, to actually physically meet before they have all this virtual interaction and then have sort of a capstone thing. I don't know if anybody studied that. I, I, I really believe it. I'd like to see a study on it, the value of actually meeting first before going virtual. Um, there is a group of intern, well, uh, I don't know if I call them interns, resident advisors who travel with the students. So we have resident advisors, we have mental health professionals, turns out to be really important. Uh, set up medical facilities, arrangements where we are, things like that. It's, it's, it's a huge number of moving parts. I mean, I, um, it's, it's daunting. And, but so far, we've been extremely fortunate in the people we've hired, really good people. And we started relatively small. We only started 28. First year, um, we got free housing and free, free everything. And then they went on a gap year. We took 109. And then we grouped those two groups together. They're in Berlin now. And then we took another class that are currently in San Francisco and accepting the third group now. Any other uh, questions uh, from our virtual participants? I have one more question, and it, it might seem kind of uh, out of left field for this conference and this talk so far, but it, it kind of feeds back into a lot of the things I've been participating in lately. Um, you said you collect a lot of metrics yeah. and, and data on your students. Do they have access to that data? Do you share those metrics with all Absolutely. your students? We're totally transparent. There's a dashboard. So I mentioned that first year, we have four core competencies that the curriculum is focused on. Two of them are cognitive, critical thinking, creative thinking. Two are social, um, effective interaction, and effective communication with other people. Those break down into 11 specific aspects of one thing, for example. I mean, it's a, how you evaluate a claim, how you make decision trade-offs, um, how you analyze a problem, that kind of stuff. So each of those in turn breaks into those habits of mind and foundational concepts. They have a dashboard where they see all levels of that tree, their grades, which are updated weekly. So they know exactly where there are no surprises, no surprises. We're doing something different. I mean, the cool thing about Minerva, the, re the reason I left Stanford and all that was that 
we pushed the reset button. I mean, we took a step back and said, okay, it's 21st century. What can we do that makes sense? Goals, and we had to decide what our goals were for our students. And that took two weeks of just talking. And what, once we decided what the goals were, everything else backed into it. So, but yeah, so you can do things in Minerva. I just hired um, the 15 who had been Dean at um, University of Illinois, uh, Champaign-Urbana. And he w- he's just blown away by A, we make decisions often in one meeting and B, we act on them. Uh, often they're implemented within a week. You can't do that in most places. So it, it's really an amazing experience. If any of you are interested in applying for a faculty position, here comes the pitch, uh, or other positions, we are growing like crazy. We're hiring lots of people. Uh, take a look at our website. Uh, we're looking at uh, faculty app- applications now. Uh, please apply or encourage good people you know to apply. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Um, yes, thank, thank you. you. Yes, thank, thank you very much. Very informative. So uh, hopefully can connect with the live stream tomorrow. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all for your interest. Thank you so much. This thank is very interesting. And thanks for being so patient with their questions. Until our next uh, virtually connecting session, be well. Yeah. And yeah, and we're connecting again at 6.15 p.m. if anybody wants to come back um, for that. We'll be talking with one of the keynotes that is speaking um, tonight, or late this afternoon.